Sine die, or sine die. Either way you say it, whew, it means the end of the legislative session. We break down some of the biggest battles and bills. Battling is what Lisa Sanchez is doing to get her Boise City Council seat back after it was given to someone else. She might take that battle to a courtroom. One of Boise's busiest streets has a bit of a bend to it because bending over backwards and offering a big wad of bills wasn't enough to convince one family to move. Well, they are done, finished, complete, kaput for the year at the Idaho State House. Signy die on the 88th day. Let's throw out some other numbers out to you for this last day of the session. The first session of the 67th legislature, by the way, introduced 595 bills over these days, sent 331 of them to the governor's desk, of which he signed 328 of them. Three of them he vetoed, one of which was the first order of business on this last day of the session. So let's talk to Joe about that. How did that play out today and what happened the rest of the day? Yeah, and real quickly, I just want to mention to add to your stats, I was told as recently as this afternoon, there were several thousand pieces of draft legislation. So that's wow. the stuff that doesn't even make it to the committee and we talked so about nearly it. 600, but several thousand had ideas. Yeah. Okay. And I'm sure plenty more didn't even make it on paper. But yes, uh, the lawmakers I spoke with, Brian, they're thrilled to be done. But yes, they had one more major vote to take care of this afternoon before they could say goodbye. And to kind of recap for you, late yesterday, Governor Little vetoed legislation that would allow Idahoans to sue their local library if they can show a minor is getting harmful materials there. You know, $2,500 per lawsuit, according to that proposal, and that would be the winnings. But Governor Little expressed concerns about libraries being sued into oblivion, so he vetoed the legislation. That was a session long topic, but lawmakers have the chance to override that library bill here today, which drew questions. Would they stay and work on the new options if the veto failed? The answer for you is no. Lawmakers failed to override the governor's veto by one vote, and from there, they basically decided to call it a year. And I can tell you, though, through my conversations with state house leaders just this afternoon, the topic and the idea will be back next year. And there's a good chance that something on the topic of materials and libraries passes. The major hang up is the legal penalties at twenty five hundred dollars. I know there's negotiations around that number, so we'll see how that progresses. But yes, lawmakers are now touting their accomplishments to end the year. And if you ask Idahoans, maybe the biggest thing lawmakers accomplished this year was property taxes. Yes, lawmakers passed a package that aims to be, you know, relief, millions of dollars in real relief. And House Speaker Mike Moyle described to me earlier the impact that families will see. But there is a caveat from the speaker. Moyle has said for years that there's only so much the legislature can do. He says local governments need to help out. Well, it means that it, you're going to get between a 10 and 25 percent reduction depending where you live in your property tax bill. It means that the local governments have the opportunity to add to that so it could be even greater than that. And it means that going forward, since it's tied to the sales tax, it's going to grow. So that, that relief is not one time, it's, it, it grows over time. So, so it's, it's a good, good start at uh, addressing that issue. But I still, Joe, like I said, you still gotta remember though, the state doesn't collect them and doesn't spend them. And so we've now taken an ongoing sales tax revenue to subsidize those local taxing districts. And hopefully they will do the right thing and, and uh, pass those savings on, but also try to help on their end of the side too. So depending on where you live, you might see different uh, property tax reduction, but the speaker's saying 10 to 25%. But only time will really tell how far the property tax relief will go. But I've already heard conversations at the Capitol about what the next option or idea to address property tax could be. Now, meanwhile, Idaho Democrats, they also held their end of session conference today and they expressed major concerns about the direction of the state and the legislature. Social bills are really a concern that Democrats point out. Abortion legislation, content in schools, voting rights, just to name a few. And one bill that did passed the legislation was signed by Governor Little. As we talked about at length, it, provi it prevents minors who are transgender from getting hu uh, hormone therapy or puberty blockers or transitional surgery in Idaho. Now, Democrats say that sends a message to communities in Idaho, one that is not welcoming. This was brought by people who have no dog in the fight, who just want to tell someone else what to do. So that sends a pretty frightening message to the people of Idaho. But I think it sends a very, very disturbing message about how these lives are valued. Because I'll tell you, I met last week with several uh, transgender teenagers and their parents. Every one of these teenagers 
had uh, made a very serious suicide attempt and had ended up in an inpatient hospital situation um, because their gender dysphoria was so extreme. Um, they were then put on these, these puberty suppressors and hormones, which have a 63% effectiveness rate at reducing suicidality. These kids are fine now. They're happy. They're getting good grades. They're excited to go on to college. But their future and their safety entirely depends on access to these medications, um, which are now being taken away from them by their government. Um, we are endangering these kids' lives. I think this came out to the legislature. This is not news from, to them. Yeah. They heard this testimony, and they acted, I think, with reckless disregard um, as to the effect this is going to have on these kids and families, uh, many of whom are going to be driven out of state or potentially driven to self-harm. Idaho Democrats also touched on the belief that there will soon be several lawsuits over legislation that lawmakers approved, and that includes the transgender health care topic, but also the topic of abortion trafficking. And lawmakers passed and Governor Little signed into law a provision that makes it a crime for a minor to be taken out of state for an abortion without their parents' permission. And Brian, I've spoken with lawmakers uh, who question, you know, how is this legal at all? And we'll find out. I know there's some concerns about how much money could be spent over the next few months in terms of uh, lawsuits on legislation. Republicans tell me, though, they're worth defending because they believe in the legislation they passed. And let me throw out some, no some more numbers to you. Speaking of, well, potential laws that could see a courtroom, House Bill 71, uh, the governor's office let us know there was a lot of phone calls made, a lot of emails sent for or against. And so the numbers are for those who wanted him to veto that bill, House Bill 71, 12,167 wanted him to, but 21,796 people wanted him to sign House Bill 71, which he did. Wow, more than 30,000 calls in a matter of a few days. Yeah, exactly. Wow. All right. All right. Thank you very much, Joe. So you heard Joe say it. They say it, and we, of course, say it at the end of every session. When they call it quits for the year, the legislature adjourns sine die, meaning there will be no other day designated to return. And it's literally Latin for without a day. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It is my great pleasure <laughs> to move that the House of Representatives of the first regular session of the 67th Idaho Legislature adjourn, adjourn sine die. Adjourning sine die. Mr. President, I move the Senate adjourn sine die. And the Senate stands adjourn sine die. Sine die. Sine die. Sine die. Sine die. Does that sound right? Well, not if you know Latin, and not if you look it up on the Google machine. Sine die. It's the more British English pronunciation, but also the more Latin sounding one. Sine die. Now, in the US, it's often said as sine die as well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Did you catch that little snickle there, little snicker there? And him saying, yeah, like Americans say it this way. Okay, so Julian Miguel, who's soothing, by the way, to listen to, getting in a little jab at the Americans in our pronunciation. Sine die, ha, yeah, that's how they say it. But at least one, at least one member of the House of Representatives nailed it today, saying goodbye on the House floor. And the House, the Idaho House of Representatives is now adjourned sine die. Speaker Moyle nailing it, and the dogs, the legislatures, I should say, the first session of the 67th legislature are adjourned and out, sine die. I'd first like to put forward the appointment of LaTanya Haney-Keith for the District 3 seat. And with that, Lisa Sanchez no longer has her city council seat for now. Boise City Council held a special session today to swear in two council members, new, two new council members to fill those vacant seats. Latonia, Latonia, excuse me, Haney Keith, who you just heard, and she's going to finish out the term for District Seat 3, District 3 seat, that is. That was previously Sanchez's seat. Colin Nash, he's going to sit in that at large seat. Remember, Lisa Sanchez lost her council seat at the beginning of the year after she moved out of her district when she said she received a notice she had to move out of her home in the North End in December of last year. Well, Sanchez threw her hat back into the ring when Mayor Lauren McLean opened applications to fill those vacant seats. Lane Clegg was also leaving. Sanchez was on the short list. She didn't make the cut, though, and lost her seat to Haney Keith. Yesterday, Sanchez tweeted, To honor the will of District 3, voters who re-elected me on November 2nd, 2021, I humbly request for current council members decline that nomination, which they didn't. She tagged all of them, by the way, in her tweet. Well, they didn't decline it. Sanchez might take it a step further, though, by threatening legal action against Boise for being removed from her city council seat. We did reach out to Sanchez's uh, office 
uh, and we also reached out to the city of Boise's council office and the city of Boise itself to try to figure out and confirm what this means with the threat of legal action, but only the city of Boise responded saying, I believe Sanchez's council has been ongoing communication in ongoing communication with our outside counsel and any and all that communication is exempt from public disclosure, meaning they're not going to share with us, of course, because they are attorney client privileges. So they didn't really answer our question about that legal action, but they didn't deny it either. All city council seats are up for election for, by district, by the way, on November 7th of this year. The Boise Town Square Mall will be celebrating its 35th anniversary coming up this fall. And if you lived in the area during that time, there's a good chance you've visited the mall. You know, looking for a new pair of shoes, new pair of shades, or just because you want a Wetzel's pretzel. And in doing so, if you've ever entered on the west side, been on, been one of the 23,000 or so daily drivers on that stretch of Milwaukee Street, maybe you've wondered why that road around the mall on that side is so curvy. Well, we didn't either until we heard the reason why. And then we were like, do tell because we love learning about and getting to know I know. A quick scan across a map of West Boise shows most of the north south streets are pretty straight until you get to the area around the town square mall where a drive south on Milwaukee Street goes from Beeline to Bendy. But why? As you can see, this, this curve in the road is unusual. Uh, it's an unusual site characteristic. Jump back seven months ago when Boise City Council was considering allowing a change in signage for the strip mall across the street. Again, you're in this curve. Jeff Huber was making his case. There's one little window there where you can might glance and see maybe a shop front, but it's very difficult when you're trying to drive. When he relayed the reason. So uh, this slide is an important slide. For the roundabout part of the road. See, when the mall was built, and this whole area was master planned, really, in, in unison. Uh, and everyone thought that this road was going to go straight through here. Everyone except Mrs. Ott and her farm, <laughs> who lived right there. <laughs> Mrs. Ott, Peg, and her husband Larry were the owners of a 10-acre parcel on Ash Park Lane. The Otts bought the land in 1960, wanting to live out their lives in true rural fashion in a turn of the century farmhouse. And they weren't interested in turning it over. Mrs. Ott was quite a character, the last of the true pioneers, really. For decades, developers, including Huber, tried to make this area ripe for retail. Mrs. Ott refused. I would go to her house, sit in the living room with her. She'd make me cowboy coffee and I'd try everything possible to try to get her to sell her property. Standing in her living room in a dirt floor with a big wood chopping block next to the wood heater stove. She had sheep coming through there. She had pet 
blue jays inside. It was, it was really something to see. You see, Mrs. Ott didn't want to see her home and sanctuary cease to exist. The developers offered her millions of dollars. I'd say, Mrs. Ott, let's go get you another farm with a nice farmhouse. Nope, she wouldn't do it. Money may talk, but not to Mrs. Ott. Even into the 80s, when developers decided to move forward with the building of Boise's first mall, they were forced to move Milwaukee traffic around the Ott farm. Telling the Idaho statesman in 1989, they just ignore it. And that farm sat there until they both died, and they left that farm to their legal counsel. In 1986, the Ott farm was finally sold, soon to be filled with outlet stores and restaurants. But that's why that curve is in the road today. All because of the obstinance of one Mrs. Ott. And as you heard Mr. Uber say, when Mrs. Ott passed away, the land was left to her lawyer since the Otts didn't have any heirs. They did have a lot of animals, though, roaming the premises. Lots of birds, you know, fowl, water or otherwise, dogs, cats, a cow, even a neutered ram. One other interesting part about the Otts' impact on the mall. While they were building it, they had a berm built up around their property to keep all their critters in and keep people visiting the mall from peering in on their self-sufficient lives. That berm? is why there is an uphill part on the northwestern parking lot. Like most things that survive into their 90s, the Boise Airport has gone through several changes over the years. Today marks the Travel Hub's 97th birthday, from when it was first located on the current campus of Boise State to the groundbreaking out by Gowan Field. That happened in the late 1930s. They were going for a futuristic look back in the redesigned planning days of the 1960s. Take a look at it there, and they kind of nailed it, as you see what it looked like in 1975 with the kind of berms there. Yeah. You know, it didn't look like that when I moved here back in the late 1990s, and it got another complete makeover a few years after that. But what about the days before the Boise Airport existed? Well, we find out about that in today's 208 Redial. 
In 1903, getting from point A to point B suddenly got more interesting, thanks to the Wright brothers. If people could get around by plane, well, so could their stuff, like a lightweight letter. About 15 years after that first flight, the idea of delivering mail by air started bouncing around what was then called the U.S. Post Office Department. By 1918, uh, the U.S. Post Office Department had convinced Congress to appropriate some funds to try to test some of these ideas to even see if it was possible. It was, with some help. Because the Post Office Department, of course, didn't own planes and they didn't employ pilots, they employed mail carriers. Cue the Kelly Act. In 1925, Congress allowed the U.S. Post Office to contract with commercial pilots to carry the mail. So that settled the who. What about the how? Well, they didn't have to start from scratch. They looked across the country and they were really hoping to build on a transcontinental route that the uh, U.S. Army had helped develop between 1918 and 1925. One of those routes? From Pasco, Washington to Elko, Nevada with a stopover in Boise. But who would run that route? There was an individual who had been very instrumental in building the aviation industry, and his name was Walter Varney. Varney, a World War I vet, owned and operated a flight school, so he had access to pilots. Pilots like Leon Cuddyback. Remember that name, not that it isn't memorable. But in Boise, we didn't have an airstrip in 1925. Varney also had access to land, buying a flat piece of property south of the Boise River. And although it had trees and some brush, they were able to clear that, that acreage and build an airstrip. Back to Cuddyback. On April 6, 1926, he headed to Elko, taking off from Pasco in a single engine plane with just one bag of mail. An overland trip that would normally take 49 hours. They departed at 6 a.m and it took him about four hours to make it to Boise. Cuddyback touched down to fanfare, but he didn't stay on the ground for long. He picked up Boise's bundle and took off for Elko. Once there, Franklin Rose, another Varney pilot, was waiting to return along the same route. He unfortunately encounters some very bad weather, uh, is blown about 75 miles off course, and he has to crash land in southwestern Idaho in a grain field. Rose survived, and so did the mailbag. Ultimately, Rose ended up walking with mail, carrying some of it by horseback, and then ultimately driving it back into Boise so that it could then be put on a plane and that route could be continued to Pasco. A turbulent start for sure to the Boise Spur, but they didn't stay grounded for long. And the airstrip started seeing more than just airmail. Like when 25-year-old Charles Lindbergh landed the Spirit of St. Louis at Varney's Airport as part of a 48-state tour in September 1927. Then came the commercial concept, and Varney began flying people around the West. Varney ended up building a hangar and adding additional buildings to the site. By 1930, Varney Airlines was sold to United Airlines. Yeah, that United Airlines. Meanwhile, Boise was growing, and so was its first institute of higher learning. So Boise Junior College had been leasing space on the north side of the river, and when this opportunity arose, uh, they relocated to the south bank and built their first administrative building and you know, added some dormitories and, and classrooms over time. And so uh, eventually the use of that airstrip, uh, it, it ceased. And so in uh, 1936, thereabouts, uh, the decision was made to, to officially relocate the Boise Airport to Gowan Field. But the original airfield was still on school grounds. That is, until Boise Junior College needed to build a football field. And one could say the Broncos took control of the airspace after that. By the way, when the airport moved to Gowan Field in 1938, it had the longest runway in the U.S. at the time at 8,800 feet. One of Varney's original hangars was also moved to the new location, and it was there until those major renovations that we were talking about were made to Boise's airport in 2003. Boise Airport said last year they had four and a half million passengers come through, and they're expected and excited to continue to serve as the Treasure Valley's gateway to adventure.
All right, on the last day of this legislative session, let's get to your comments like this one from Jen and Meridian. I want to know if the numbers of phone calls Governor Little received for House Bill 71 include the robocalls Blaine Kanzati with the Idaho Family Policy Center paid for. That shut down the phone lines. The phone lines weren't shut down, but they were certainly clogged. And we do know that the Idaho Family Policy Center did pay for a robocall system, but it didn't go directly to the governor's office from what we understand, but it went out to some lists of numbers. And those people who got those phone calls and then were given a choice to punch a number and then be redirected to the governor's office directly. That's kind of how that worked. And then once they got on there, a series of keystrokes would then direct them through whether or not they wanted to vote yes or no on House Bill 71. So it wasn't a direct line of robocalls to the governor's office. That's not how it worked from what we understand. Could you clarify when Idaho homeowners will actually be see these property tax reliefs, uh, these property taxes relief, I should say, will it be this year or in 2024? According to Joe, he says tax year of 2024, Todd. So the same Republicans that raised hell about the COVID vaccine because government has no business in their medical decisions are the same ones that are dictating what women and transgenders can do. Hypocrisy at its max, says Debbie. We need more Mrs. Ott. What a way to stand up for what you cherish. Now we are the sheep. Government telling us how to live every day, says Robert. We'll be back at it again tomorrow. We'll see you then.